who can attempt a technical foul free throw? Any player or eligible substitute. Simple, clear, concise. You want to take that with you onto the court. You want to have that available to you at any given time. Greetings and welcome to our brand new show, Basketball Rules Expert Show. I'm Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com, where we craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. If you're new here, hit subscribe and the notify bell because this content is going to be coming hot and heavy over the next few weeks as we get started for the brand new basketball season. In creating Basketball Rules Expert Show, the goal is to elevate the rules off of the written page, breathe life into them, bring forward ideas, concepts, how they all fit together so that you have a better understanding of the rules, but also be able to take the rules with you onto the basketball court where it's most important. Now, bottom line is, as basketball officials, we need to be expert at our craft. We need to be experts. Rules knowledge is one of the things that almost all officials have the opportunity to shore up the areas where things may be a little unclear. Or if you're a brand new official, this is going to be great for you. We're going to talk about basic fundamentals of the rules, how to apply them, etc. But it's rules all the time. No opinions, no mechanics, no signals, no positioning, no communication skills, just the rules. All right, I'm super excited. Let's get started with the very first episode of the Basketball Rules Expert Show. Let's get started with the show. Question. The following would result in a traveling violation if a player holding the ball lifts their pivot foot and then does which? A. Pass the ball. B. Shoot the ball. C. Begin a dribble, or D, drop the ball to the floor? Pretty simple question, but it's a great way to start here at Basketball Rules Expert Show because it forces us to go to the most important rule in the rules book, and that is rule number four, definitions. Rule number four, definitions, is a high priority for all basketball officials. It's the starting point. It gives you the fundamental building blocks upon which other rules will refer to and be built. So a high priority for new officials or officials wanting to become basketball rules experts. Our options on the question are pass the ball, shoot the ball, begin a dribble, or drop the ball to the floor. Let's go to rule four, section 44, and have a look. The important article is article number three which reads, after coming to a stop and establishing a pivot foot, A, the pivot foot may be lifted but not returned to the floor before the ball is released on a pass or a try for goal. Our first two options in the question were to pass the ball, which has clearly been defined as legal, or shoot the ball, which has clearly been defined as legal. B, if the player jumps, neither foot may be returned to the floor before the ball is released on a pass or try for goal. That's not relevant to the question we're answering. Or C, the pivot foot may not be lifted before the ball is released to start a dribble. Our definition clearly defines that it is illegal to release the ball for a dribble after lifting the pivot foot. So C in our question is obviously the correct answer. But what about option D, drop the ball to the floor? That is not addressed by the rule. This is an uh, important point to recognize is that not all the things that can happen on the basketball court will be addressed by the rules book. So it's really a great piece of advice to understand that everything is legal until the rules book says it's not legal. Everything is legal till the rules book says it's not legal. 
The rules book may say, yes, indeed, that is a legal thing. It may say that is definitely illegal, or it may not address it at all. And if it doesn't address it at all, it's legal, right? That's a super important concept to understand as we get started in becoming a basketball rules expert. All right, so our first question, we go directly to rule four, the most important rule in the rules book, and we learn a basic concept about applying the rules and that if it's not expressly illegal, then treat it by rule as legal. Question. The official bounces the ball to A1 for the first of two free throws. The ball hits A1 in the leg and bounces away. While the ball remains in the free throw semicircle and before A1 picks it up, B3 requests a timeout. Our options. A. Ignore the request and return the ball to A1. B. The timeout request is granted, but not until after A1's first free throw. C. Grant B3's request for a timeout at that point. Or D. None of the above. I bounce the ball to the thrower, bounces off their leg. One of the opponents of the thrower immediately requests a timeout while the ball is in the free throw semicircle, but before A1 has picked it up. What are we to do? What this question brings up are a couple of important points, and that is exactly how this show is gonna work. We have a simple question. What are the things that we can, what can of worms can we open up about the rules involved in this situation? First of all, let's recognize that what we have in a free throw is a way to make the ball live after the ball is dead. In this situation, obviously a foul has occurred and the player is going to the line to attempt free throws. The ball became dead at some point when the foul occurred. And now we are going to use this restart as a way to make the ball live. There are three restarts in the game of basketball. There is a jump ball, there is a throw in, and there are free throws. Those are our three ways to make the ball live. The fundamental question on this play is, when can a player request a timeout and have those conditions been met? So when can a player or a head coach request a timeout? Let's take a look at rule five, section eight, Timeout, and the rule reads, timeout occurs and the clock, if it's running, shall be stopped when an official, Article 3, grants and signals a player's slash head coach's oral or visual request for a timeout, such request being granted only when A, the ball is at the disposal or in control of a player of his or her team, or B, the ball is dead unless replacement of a disqualified or injured players or player directed to leave the game is pending and a substitute is available and required. Let's, let's take that second part of B, the ball is dead unless, and we're going to set that aside for now. What it's talking about is a situation where, let's say we have a disqualified player. Coach, that player has five fouls. They're disqualified. I need a substitute. We have a short period where the coach needs to supply a substitute. The coach that requests a timeout. And we say, no, by rule, you can't have a timeout in this situation. This situation where we need to replace a player. Even though the ball's dead. Every other dead ball scenario, you can always request a timeout. But in this one special instance, no. So let's set that aside for now. And our options are the ball is at the disposal or in control of a player of his or her team. Or B, the ball is dead. Plus that special circumstance. So those are our two options. We can grant that. So when the ball is dead, five players from Team A, five players from Team B, Team A coach, Team B coach can all request a timeout when the ball is dead. When Team A has the ball at their disposal or have team control, 
In that instance, only the five players from Team A or the Team A head coach can request a timeout. So basically, when the ball is dead, everybody can. When the ball is in possession of a team, only that team can. Obviously, the defensive team can't call a timeout when the other team has the ball. In our play scenario, was the ball live? The official bounced the ball to the thrower. Had the ball become live? That's our fundamental question. When does the ball become live on a free throw? That's a simple question, and that's something we have to know. Let's take a look at the rule six, live ball. And we'll take a look at article two. The ball becomes live when, on a jump ball, when the tossed ball leaves the official's hand. B, on a throw in, it is at the disposal of a thrower. Or C, on a free throw, it is at the disposal of the free thrower. So the ball will become live when it's at the disposal of the free thrower. But the ball's right there. They can pick it up, right? Is, by rule, is the ball at their disposal in our play scenario where I bounce the ball? I hit the player in the leg. Sorry, man. The ball's bounced at their feet. And before they pick it up, a timeout request. Has the ball become live? We can answer this question if we refer back to our good friend, Rule 4. Section 4, ball location at the disposal. At the disposal is defined in Rule 4. That's why Rule 4 is so important. Article 7, the ball is at the disposal of a player when it is A, handed to a thrower or free thrower, B, caught by a thrower or free thrower after it is bounced to him, C, placed on the floor at the spot, or D, available to a player after a goal and the official begins their throwing count. The ball becomes at the disposal when it is caught by a thrower or free thrower after it is bounced to him. I bounced the ball to the thrower, it hit them in the leg, they never caught it. Therefore, it's not at their disposal. Therefore, it's not live. If it's not live, it's dead. During a dead ball, who can request a timeout? Five players from Team A, five players from Team B, head coach from Team A, head coach from Team B. Any of those can request a timeout. This is our scenario. B3 has requested a timeout while the ball is dead. That is legal, and we should grant the timeout. Our answer is C, grant B3's request for a timeout at that point. Question, when does a free throw start? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> After the session we just had with the previous question, this should be pretty obvious. When does a free throw start? A, when the ball is released on a try. B, when the official releases the ball on the toss to the free thrower. C, when the ball is placed at the disposal of the free thrower. Or D, when the official walks in to administer the free throw. Clearly, the answer is C, when the ball is placed at the disposal of the free thrower. As we learned in the previous question. Question. A1 attempts the first of two free throws for a technical foul. Who may attempt the second of the two free throws awarded to Team A? Answers. A, any Team A substitute that the opposing coach selects. B, any of the other four Team A players the opposing coach selects. C, only A1 who shot the first free throw. Or D, any eligible Team A substitute any of the other four Team A players, or A1 who shot the first free throw? Simple question. We're going to find the answer in Rule 8, Section 3. Attempting technical foul free throws. Wow, this is a simple rule. The free throws awarded because of a technical foul may be attempted by any player of the offended team, including an eligible substitute, or designated starter. The coach or captains shall designate the free thrower. So it's clearly defined. May be attempted by any player of the offended team. 
Remember, at any given time, we only have five players. Those are the players who are on the court, including an eligible substitute, a team member who's on the bench and eligible to participate, or designated starter. And that's included there because we have, a let's say, a pregame dunk by the opponent. We're going to start the game with a attempt of technical foul free throws. That may include a designated starter because they're not yet a player. If you think about this too absurdum, you know, you sort of think this through, this rule through, let's say there were multiple technical fouls and this team is going to attempt six free throws related to technical fouls. They could have substitute number one, come off and shoot the first one. Substitute number two, come off and shoot the second one. Number three, the third one, four, the fourth one, five, you know, the player at the end of the bench who never gets to play, the coach say, hey, I want that guy to shoot my free throws. All of that is feasible because any player or eligible substitute, that's the key takeaway. Who can attempt a technical foul free throw? Any player or eligible substitute. Simple, clear, concise. You want to take that with you onto the court, you wanna have that available to you at any given time. Somebody asks you in the middle of a game, who can shoot the technical foul free throws? Any player or eligible substitute. That should be just like coming off your lips as soon as the question is asked. That is gonna wrap it up for our very first episode of the Basketball Rules Expert Show. If you haven't already done so, you can like and subscribe below. Here's a challenge. I've created a quiz that encompasses all the things that we've covered in the video today. It's at abetterofficial.com slash expert zero one, or you just click the link above. Hey, if you want to support the show, you can always buy us a cup of coffee at abetterofficial.com slash coffee. All right, here's some additional video contact. Here's a video that I recommend, and here's a video that YouTube thinks would be the best video for you. Make your choice and we'll see you in the next video.